Hey everybody. Um, I hope this time this comes through because I pressed the right button. So um, first I want to thank everybody for ooh, liking and sharing and um, viewing my first little Facebook talk. And um, thank you for that. That really kind of made me feel um, really pretty good because a lot of people are telling me, Judy, you know, you drop these nuggets, and I, and I do. I drop them on friends and family. <laughs> they're kind of sick and tired. Um, so they're like, you drop these nuggets, and you ought to just, you know, go ahead and let other people know about them. And um, I thank you for making me comfortable with that because I've never been very comfortable um, with talking to large groups of people. I've had to make myself do that. Like right now, hands are sweaty. So, um, but today, this morning, I was in prayer. And I got a call from a very dear friend, and we were talking about how some time ago um, he was really, and I use his words, jacked up. He was miserable, bitter, angry, upset at something that he really, really wanted. He had tried to convince um, himself and other people that this is what was going to be great, and it didn't turn out the way he wanted it to turn out. And, you know, true to form, like all of us, whenever we're upset about things didn't come out the way we want, we find God. We say, oh, God, you know, why did this happen? Why did it turn out the way it did? And in that prayer, it wasn't even the main prayer. The main prayer was for him, like, you know, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm hurt about how this turned out. But in that prayer was a side prayer for him where he said, God, you know, this is what I really need. I really need somebody who's got my back. I really need somebody who's going to be there for the long haul. I really need somebody. And that was not even the main thing that he was talking to God about. But, you know, fast forward to this time and he's like, you know, I wasn't expecting God to answer my prayer. He did. He answered it. It's almost 100% what he prayed for. But it was in a form. It was in a way in which he hadn't expected and, you know, the first thing that pops into my mind, and it's because of the way I was raised, is a, you know, biblical story. First one that popped in my mind was Jesus. I said, you know, Eve in the Garden of Eden, just as she's being escorted out with Adam, is, is, is already saying there's going to be a seed that's going to come and it's going to crush the head of our enemy. And so the, the idea of a Messiah was already in the mindset of Adam and Eve as they left the promise, the, the Garden of Eden. And they carried that promise through so many generations. And fast forward to what we know as the New Testament, and all of a sudden here's Jesus. And we're like, well, the people of that time were like, what? Wasn't there a problem with his mother being pregnant way before, you know, she got married? And, and isn't he the product of that problem, you know? And they say that he wasn't really that great to look at. He wasn't, you know, like the way we want to paint him with blue eyes and long, flowing, wonderfully, you know, permed hair. But, you know, it just, he wasn't what they expected. Especially the religious people were not looking for that type of Messiah. Never mind that he went about doing things completely different than the way they had been trained and brought up to do things. He came and he shattered a lot of that. He healed people on a Sabbath and he was sitting around with all the drunks and the prostitutes and he did everything different. And yet he was fulfilling, you know, the purpose. And so God dropped in my spirit today and I'm going to talk about my own life because, you know, I'm always transparent with my own life and I'm going to talk about my parents because, you know, I love to talk about them. But God dropped in my spirit today that you've got to get comfortable with three things. You've got to get comfortable with the means, the method, and the maintenance of walking in your purpose. So I already said about Jesus, but you know, we have other biblical examples. We've got Joseph. Joseph gets a dream. I'm going to be in the palace. You know, what happened? He goes and tells people. And that's why I never worry about whether you tell people. You say, oh, don't tell anybody anything. No, if he hadn't told his brothers, they wouldn't have propelled him. The means in which he left his home probably wasn't what he expected. But by telling them, they were part of the process. And that first part was to throw him in a, a pit and then to sell him into slavery. Okay, that, that, that was not what he was expecting. How in the world is that going to get me? 
but it got him out of his home. It took him into a foreign, strange land. But then the method that he even ended up in the palace was through jail, was being thrown in jail. That's how he got there. You know, so the means in which he left was not what he expected. The method in which he got there was not what he expected. And yet God maintained him through slavery, through jail time, and even in the palace. So, you know, if you don't like that example, you've got David. David, who is anointed when he's a kid. You're going to be the next king of Israel. Where does he go? He goes back to the sheep. He goes back sitting there playing his harp and, and killing bears and lions. But he doesn't necessarily right away get into where he's supposed to be. And then the method in which he gets to the palace is by killing a giant, is by facing probably one, something that everybody else was afraid of. He was able to face because what he believed in is God. He believed, you know, who is this uncircumcised Philistine coming up against the armies of the living God? He believed in God. And so then even when he gets there and he's maintained in the palace, you know, Saul hated his guts, tried to kill him. He had to escape into the wilderness, into the desert. And God maintained him, actually gave him an army of men who would be serving with him as part of his rule. So God has a means, a method, and a maintenance. And sometimes you're not going to like it. You're just not. Or you're not even just going to understand it. And I'm going to use my own life. You know, when I was younger, I thought that all I was going to ask for, all I wanted, was this corner office. I was in corporate America. I was like, you know, this is where I'm supposed to be. By the time I was in my late 20s, I was a mutual fund manager, moving millions of dollars around, making buku bucks. Even from there, God took me on to be assistants to major, major people in New York City, as far as CEOs, founders. And yet, that really wasn't it. The means that he took me from that into my purpose was the death of my parents. I wouldn't be talking to you probably even today if my parents were not removed from my life. Because it was after their death that I began to seek God for what was I supposed to do. I had promised to stay with them until they were gone. And so now it was, what am I supposed to do, God? They're not here. And I'm sitting here, no husband, newborn, child just about to be diagnosed with autism. Where am I supposed to go? I don't even know where I'm going because at that point, all of a sudden, nothing else made any kind of sense. Running after rates to quote at three o'clock, running after new business so that I can say, you know, I managed all these things. It suddenly didn't make any sense anymore. It really wasn't who I was supposed to be. It was what I could do, but it really wasn't who I was supposed to be. So the means in which he propelled me out of New York State was the death of my parents. The method in which he began to propel me into who I was supposed to be is something that I don't wish on my worst enemy. He used poverty and he used disability. Okay, I can tell you more about poverty, something I didn't know about until my 30s. I can tell you more about poverty. I can tell you about bread soup kitchens. I can tell you about pantries. I can tell you about food boxes. I can tell you about WIC. I can tell you about food stamps. I can tell you about how you can sell your food stamps. I can tell you about all of that stuff, none of which I had any idea. But what I learned from that method, you can give me this much. And I'll run a house with two kids, cat and a dog. You can give me this much. And I'll maintain what I already maintain, a 2,000 square foot home. You can give me that much. Fishes and loves people. You can give me that much. And me and God will figure out a way to not only touch your life, friends' lives, strangers' lives. That's the thing I learned through poverty. That it isn't about how much you have. It's what you do with what you have. And disability, I didn't bring it because I just I didn't feel like looking for it. But there was a point in my life where I was on 16 pills a day. I was laying in a bed, staring more at a popcorn ceiling than I was at anything else. And anything I thought I could do, I sure wasn't doing. And I was in that position for more than a year until God saw fit to bring the right surgeon that put me back on my feet. 
Okay, so he used that time, all that time that I'm laying in bed, I'm thinking, you know, I could either sleep or watch some more soap operas. God told me, pick up my word. Pick up my word and begin to listen. I said, well, God, look, I was a twinkle in my father's eye when he met my mom, and I know all about the word. But he was like, no, not the way I'm going to show it to you right now, because now I have your undivided attention. You're not going anywhere. You're going to listen. And he used that time of disability to pour his spirit into me, to open up his words in ways that I had never seen with all of my vacation Bible school and Sunday school and children's church. All of that stuff had been a foundation, but now it suddenly had wings and rooms and closets and windows and doors that I didn't even know there was a building to be built. And so that was the means and the method. And then there was the maintenance. The maintenance that he has helped me do, bringing the right people into my life. Do you know there's been times that I've opened up an envelope and only a check fell out and it was the right amount of money that I needed so that my rent could continue to be paid? Do you know that they've gone to churches and I've been called up and people have put into my hands the exact amount, not only that I could pay a tithe, but then I could also go and pay a bill and keep some things going. Do you know in all this time of poverty and disability, the lights have never gone off, the phones have been maintained, the roof has been maintained. I've seen the eviction notices on doors. But guess what? He always came through just in time when he gave me favor with the rental people that they never went through with anything. We know you're going to come up with it. We know that you're going to do it. How did they know? They didn't know. It was because I knew God and I knew God was going to come up with it. But I didn't know the means, the method, or even the maintenance of how he was going to help me and propel me into my purpose. And so I'm telling you today. You may not like it that the car broke down just as you needed to get somewhere. You may not like it that you had that child and that father continued to keep on moving and didn't even stop and take a look at you crossways. You may not like it that the job said, I'm sorry, I got to lay you off. You may not like it that the person you thought that was going to be in your life left. But look for the means, the method, and the maintenance that God is going to bring in to continue you on your purpose. Because he hasn't forgotten about you. And I'm going to read the scripture. Well, I was going to talk about my parents, but no, I will go ahead and show you their picture. Because I'm going to show you a picture of some people who obviously, you know, if it was up to them, they probably would have never met. I'm going to show you this picture. I hope you can see it. You see those people? You see those people? Okay, I'm going to try to get the words out of the way. There's a woman, okay? You see how well-dressed she is, right? She's a well-dressed woman. And you see that little short, balding man right there? Okay, that was my father. They grew up in totally different places. They grew up in totally different countries. My father didn't even have a high school. He just went to high school, and he got out around 19 or 20, so that lets you know that he had a little trouble getting out of there. My mother, in the meantime, went to a boarding school at 9 when the entrance level was 12 and finished her education at Cambridge University in England. Okay? Let's talk about the fact that they were 22 years apart. My dad was pushing 50 when he came across as this 27-year-old woman and said, Hey, I've been praying for a wife, and I believe you're it. He didn't say, oh, my gosh, she makes too much doggone money. She didn't, he didn't say, oh, well, she's kind of cute for a chocolate girl. He didn't say, oh, my gosh, she's taller than me. I know she ain't going to have no time for me. Oh, my God, look at the way she's dressed. She can't even have anything to do with me. He said, I'm praying for a wife. And when God provided him the woman that fit the means, the method, and the maintenance of what he wanted and what God had for him, he approached her, and he said, you're it. And God gave them, let me show you the picture again. God gave them 35 wonderful years, okay? 35 wonderful years. Don't worry about that there's no time. Did you think you're running out of time? You are not running out of time. God is outside of time and he controls it. And what he wants for you, he will bring it in his due season and it'll be the right season for you. So don't rush. Don't rush. Okay, look at the picture again. Look at the picture again. That's me standing there. I'm 18 years old. I'm about to graduate. Okay, I'm about to graduate. Do you know how old that makes that man? That man is 68 years old, standing there. Okay, and never mind that he had an eight-year-old daughter behind me. Eight. Don't think God does not see what he has for you. Don't think that what you are trying to make happen is going to be deterred because of any desert situation or any loss of any job or any loss of any income or any loss of any health. Don't think it. 
Because I'm going to read a scripture that we all like to read. We all like to talk about this scripture. But do we really walk in confidence? And I'm reading Romans 8 and 28. I'm reading it out of my Amplified. You know, I change up my versions on a regular. I'm reading out of the Amplified. And it says, we know. Okay, wait a minute. Do you really know? Are you guessing? You have some doubts some days. But you're going to get to the point where you says, and we know with great confidence. Not a little bit. Not some, some timing. Loosey-goosey. You're going to have to know with great confidence that God, okay, not you, not your family, not your mother, not your father, not that girlfriend, not your wife, but you're going to have to know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about you, do, do you really even understand that? Do you understand? He says, I've numbered the hairs on your head. I'm deeply concerned about you. He has never, don't think he, the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, but don't even think that he has forgotten about you and that desert experience. So whether you're pushing paper or whether you're pushing some dirt, don't think that God has forgotten about you. It is all going to what? He causes all things to work together. It took me years to understand that the death of my parents worked together. It took me years to understand that poverty taught me some things that I could have never known sitting in corner offices. It took me years to understand that disability propelled me into being an advocate for people who could not speak for themselves or didn't know how to speak for themselves. Okay, so all things work together as a plan. If you know nothing else in God says man makes his plans and God orders his steps. But I need you. Go ahead and make your plan. But he's got one too. Just be rest assured that he's got a plan for good. Okay? Now, let me tell you something. The means, the death of my parents, was that good? No, of course it wasn't good, but it was meant for my good. Okay? Was poverty and disability good? No. Those things aren't good. We want to eradicate them from this earth. We ask everybody to come up out of them. That's fine. But that's okay because it worked together for my good. So that I could even be sitting here talking to you today. And he says, all things work together as a plan for good for those who love God. And I got to ask you today, do you love God? I know some of you think, oh, well, here she goes. She's going to be religious. And I've been religious from day one. I can't help it. It just flows out of me, okay? But do you love God? I didn't say, do you love your pastor? I didn't say, do you love church? I didn't say, do you love tithing? I don't. I didn't say, do you love doing all of this stuff? I, I didn't ask all of that. I said, do you love God? Do you love God? And if you do, he says, to those who are called. And I got a message for some of you today because that used to bother me. I was like, well, shoot, am I called? If you're on this planet, you're not aborted. You're still here. You didn't die somewhere along the line. You still are called for every length of time that you're on this planet. You are called. There is a purpose for you to walk in. Okay? I know people like to say, we're going to get you to the next level. I don't talk about that because my next level is eternity. So I'm not worried about my next level, but I can't have a write another book. I can't have another chapter. Okay? So the next level, if you want to put it that way, but you are called. Don't ever think that you've been left out of something just because you're going through something. Don't ever think that you're not supposed to be the head just because right now you're walking and it seems like you're the tail. Don't ever think that because, you know, it's taking a long time and I don't know when is it going to come. Do I need to show you the picture of the 68-year-old of the man again who's standing next to his 18-year-old daughter? Looking for that, I might ask you. That man was dapper with his little gray eyes. Okay? You are called. There is something for you to do. Don't ever think just because you have been sidelined out of one job or sidelined out of one career that there's not something else for you to do. But he says, to those who are called according to his plan and his purpose. So your purpose has to fit into his purpose. And my thing is when you love God, it will fit. It will work. But it may not come by the means, the method, or even the maintenance you thought about. But you just hold on. You hold on to God. You hold on to that purpose. And you keep your eyes open for however it comes. And when it does come, because I know it's going to come. I don't have any doubt about it. When it comes, you need to praise God. You need to worship him and you need to keep on walking. That's my word for you today. I need you to keep on walking. I need you to keep on going. You know how I am. Reach 
reach, reach for your goals. You're going to hear me say that until you're sick and tired of hearing me saying that. But don't give up just because it doesn't look the way you thought it would look. Blessings, my friends.